2017's The Shape of Water opens with Eliza, a woman who's mute. She lives in an apartment just above an old cinema and down the street from a chocolate factory, and she makes a living as a custodian at the local government laboratory. Every morning she wakes up, prepares breakfast, and shines her shoes. And I want you to follow these shoes because they're actually going to be an important motif through this film. You see, hidden beneath the movie's outward themes of discrimination and acceptance, there's another, subtler theme about consumerism. A theme that's key to understanding the villain more completely. And it starts with Eliza's shoes, and her standing outside a storefront eyeing newer, nicer red shoes, an expression of desire for a happier life. Across the hall lives Giles, a close friend who works as an artist for an advertising firm, even though he keeps getting the runaround from his boss. And he has a nostalgia for what were even then the screen stars of yesteryear. You'll never know just how much I miss you. A nostalgia that he uses to ignore the issues around him. We also get this scene where he's fascinated by this new practice called franchising, at a place he frequents despite the poor quality pies because of his unrequited crush on the young man behind the counter. And this is the part where our discussion about the theme of consumption begins to intersect with a discussion of the setting. The film takes place in the, the last, last days, days of a fair prince's, prince's reign, reign, referring to John F. Kennedy's presidency. This was a pivotal moment in United States history, a transitional and uncertain period. The hyper-conservative culture of the 50s was fading into the counterculture of the 70s. The persecution of leftists and liberals under McCarthyism had largely passed, but some artists were still locked in struggles against blacklisting. Brown vs. Board of Education had struck down de jour school segregation in 1954, but redlining and other explicit methods of race-based exclusion continued until the Civil Rights Act of 1968. America had reached a pinnacle of prosperity. Between 1947 and 1961, the national income increased 60%, and yet the new suburban enclaves, quote, weakened extended family ties, promoted homogeneity in neighborhoods, intensified racial segregation, encouraged conformity, and fostered a style of life based on traditional gender roles in the home. And in this setting, Eliza meets the amphibian man, literally inhuman, the most other of others. Guillermo del Toro explicitly named 1954's Creature from the Black Lagoon as an inspiration for this film. In interviews, he described how he felt sympathy for the creature in that movie, and wanted it to have a happy ending. You see, in that movie, the Gill Man is merely a danger to be outfought and outwitted. Even David, the character who ardently opposes harming the Gill Man, is not focused on the creature's well-being. He is only concerned with the greater research potential of a life capture, and then with escaping with his own life. The Gill Man is not meant to be empathized with. It is a monster, an other to be feared. But in the 1960s, the status of being other in the United States, a Protestant, white, male-dominated society, was changing. In fact, the very definition of what it meant to be other was being challenged. And that's why rather than violently confronting him, Eliza begins to grow close to the creature, her curiosity and kindness being rewarded in the sequence of wonderful visual storytelling. This concept of the other lines up with the movie's characters, who are a disabled woman, a gay man, a black woman, and a leftist man. All people who to some degree or another were outside of accepted culture in the United States at this time. I do really enjoy each of these central characters, they're each endearing in their own right. Zelda is a fiercely loyal friend. Dr. Hofstetler is a Soviet agent who disobeys orders he feels are morally wrong. But I want to focus a bit more on Giles right now. I mentioned him before, he is struggling to find acceptance in a society where acceptance is spotty, hoping to have a life that he is unable to have thanks to who he loves, and also struggling to keep up with changing jello colors. Green. They want the gelatin to be green now. I was told red. New concept. That's the future now. Green. This continues for some time until the powers that be decide that the studies into the amphibian man are taking too long and decide a harsher approach is needed to dissect the mysteries within by, well, dissecting the amphibian man. Eliza is horrified upon hearing the military's plan, and she begs with Giles to help her in this heartfelt plea. When he looks at me, the way he looks at me, he does not know what I lack, or how 
I am incomplete. He sees me for what I am, as I am. She may have a decent home and a decent job with good friends, but her disability holds her back from feeling whole. And the movie captures it in this beautiful exchange. It's a very powerful moment, and it shows us the tension, the deep-rooted need that Eliza feels in her life. However, Giles still refuses to help, at least at first, calling the idea ludicrous and dangerous. But he has a terrible experience where his own crush rejects him and breaks his heart. It's this moment where he's reminded of his outgroup status, a moment I'll address a bit more later on. What's important now is that this event is a catalyst that makes him change his mind and join her. Their plan to break out the amphibian man runs into its own bumps, but they get some unexpected help from Zelda, who notices her friend is acting strangely and ends up assisting. They also get help from Dimitri. When he realizes what they're up to, he uses his assets to aid in their plan. All four characters converge in this breakout scene, which is just a delightfully exciting sequence, and it leads to a successful escape. Eliza shelters the amphibian man in her own home, where their relationship deepens, and things get... Spicy. <laughs> yes, she boinks the fish, man. Ah ha 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 ha. But in all honesty, this scene is important. It's a moment of liberation, and it's found not in rejecting this other, but in embracing him in the most intimate way possible. Notice how this scene then follows up with Eliza buying those red shoes she had been eyeing before. It's an expression of renewed confidence and self-fulfillment. She's gotten her happy life, and yet, this symbol of her happiness cannot last. It's true that the investigation has been thrown off the trail, and the amphibian man demonstrates his fantastical abilities to restore human health. I'm telling you, my hair. It's my hair. Look at my arm. The wound. It's like it was never there. Look at that but his own health is slowly deteriorating. He cannot survive in a bathtub. He has to leave. So when the time comes that the seasonal harbor connects to the sea again, they will have to let him go. It's an idea that Eliza fully accepts, but it's still hard for her. She struggles to articulate how much she cares about him. And while she can't communicate it the way she wants, she can at least imagine it. A callback to the show she watched earlier, framing her thoughts and feelings in the words of the media she watches, an expression of something she can't fully express, providing a window for us into her soul. I love this scene so much. This moment right here left me breathless in the theater, and everything that follows it is a delight. Del Toro's romanticism is in full force here. It's pure cinematic magic that sweeps you off your feet. But this joy is menaced by Colonel Strickland, the military man running the laboratory, as he frantically pursues every lead to find the amphibian man. And speaking of, this is the perfect time to circle back to him, because Strickland really is at the heart of this film's themes. Let's jump back to 1950s America. In the wake of global destruction from the Second World War, the United States emerged as one of the few countries virtually untouched by the carnage. This was an era of unprecedented prosperity, again for a select in-group. And for this in-group, the best way to counter the subversive threat of communism was to indulge in capitalism. In 1951, Mayor Joseph Darcy St. Louis said that if all American workers had good affordable housing, no one in the United States would need to worry today about the threat of communism in the country. The radio was replaced by television, and characters on the screens were often engaged in low-stakes plots that were resolved with the purchase of some consumer good, encouraging each other to spend instead of save, to live above our means, the American way. The goods purchased by middle-class consumers, like a modern refrigerator or a house in the suburbs, were intended to foster traditional values. To be an American wasn't just to have the option to purchase and enjoy a factory-built home in the newly erected suburbia, it was the expectation to purchase that home. To purchase all the new appliances being manufactured. To purchase, say, a car. In 1948, a new magazine began printing called Hot Rod. According to H.F. Morehouse, the publication pictured its readers as a group of normal males who, being American, were attracted to mechanics, tinkering, competition, and the search for success. 
and keep that last one in mind as we view this scene with Strickland. Four out of five successful men in America drive a Cadillac. Is that a fact? This here is the future, and you strike me as a man who is headed there. Where? Why the future? You're the man of the future. You belong in this car. Strickland lives in the shiny suburbia. He drives the sleek modern cars. He has a wife, son, and daughter, the exemplar American nuclear family. They eat the green jello that everyone else eats, the green jello that Giles is not even allowed to advertise. Strickland is every bit a domineering alpha male. He has solidly proved himself to be in the in-group until he makes a mistake. Strickland loses the amphibian man, and when his search proves fruitless, he turns to his military superior and he pleads for clemency. And this scene is perhaps one of the most important in the movie. A man is faithful, loyal, efficient, all his life, all of it, and he is useful. And then he fails once, only once. What does that make him? Does that make him a failure? When is a man done, sir, proving himself? In this moment, we see his weakness and the flip side of being in an in-group of any kind and at any scale. Because here's the thing about in-groups and out-groups, they're entirely made up, and you have to constantly prove you still belong. And if you don't, then you're too subversive. You're a threat to the in-group's order. And that's exactly the answer that Strickland gets. Our universe will have a hole in it with your outline, and you will have moved on, and you will be unborn unmade, and undone. With that, his pay is threatened. His ability to provide for himself and his family, his ability to consume, is threatened. While he doesn't face the prospect of literal death, his life as he knows it is threatened. It pushes him to panic, and that pushes him to violence. Now, Giles serves as a foil to this. He's a white man, and could conceivably be part of this in-group if he were to simply conceal his orientation. You'll remember that this is illustrated to us early in the movie, when he specifically asks Eliza to turn off news coverage of violence at a civil rights demonstration. Oh dear God, change that off of us. I do not want to see that. I do not want to see it. That's better, that's better. Giles doesn't want to be concerned with the troubles of the out-group. But the problem is that he is part of that outgroup whether he likes it or not. And the moment he confesses his crush to the man working the diner counter, he's not only rejected, but also ordered from the establishment, blocked from the ability to consume like the in-group, and parallel with a black couple that are blocked from using the counter. This isn't just a segregation is bad brownie point scene, this moment is pivotal to the story's theme and the character's arc, because Giles receives a sharp reminder of his outgroup status. And it's also worth reminding ourselves of how Dixie Doug is presented as a false facade. You wouldn't happen to be the famous Dixie Doug himself, would you? Oh, wait, no. Pizer, truck throughout the country, they call it the franchising scene. Oh. They give us the spinners, the signage, that there's Pie Boy or mascot. I don't talk like that. I'm from Ottawa. No. It's a promise of happiness that falls short not just for Giles, but for anyone who tries their putrid pies. An awful lie. But where Giles differs from Strickland is that when faced with being struck from the in-group, his reaction is to find common cause with Eliza and the amphibian man. He realizes the lie, taking extra care to literally scrape the taste from his palate, and makes a decision to join Eliza's plan to rescue the amphibian man, and is even rewarded for this change of heart materially when the creature restores his hair. Meanwhile, Strickland has a far different path. There's a certain modicum of tragedy to Strickland, a monster molded and manufactured by the world he chooses to embrace. He finds Dimitri at a botched rendezvous and tortures him to death, finally learning the truth behind the breakout. And then he goes to Zelda's and promises divine, wrathful retribution akin to Samson until her husband points him to Eliza. And soon he's racing to the harbor. The waters have finally risen enough to allow the amphibian man to leave safely. And Eliza, true to her word, brings him to the waterfront where Strickland arrives to gun them down. But in his haste to defend his social standing, Strickland has acted rashly, because the amphibian man proves resilient to the gunshots. Strickland is faced with a sudden realization that this time, he's bitten off more than he can chew. And his eagerness to prove his self-worth, he's instead barreled right into his self-destruction. 
The amphibian man takes Eliza in his arms and returns to the sea. Under the water, he caresses her, gently kisses her, and notice how the shoes she had bought fall off her feet. Like I said before, she bought these shoes as a way to express her new confidence and satisfaction, but at that point in the story, it was only a temporary victory that could not be sustained. Now the amphibian man has returned to his home, and he's brought Eliza along with him, and as she sheds the symbols of her temporary happiness, her greatest dream comes true permanently. And this is how the film ends. Far from the human world and its trappings, far from its in-groups and out-groups and divisions. After a lifetime of being othered, a feeling incomplete, Eliza finds a place where she can be happy, in the arms of the creature whose life she saved. Here, she can just be Eliza, full stop. In the arms of the amphibian man, she is accepted. She is whole. She is complete. <laughs>